I've spent the past week listening to election-winning speeches. Surprisingly, they have a lot in common. Regardless of whether the speaker is left or right-wing, if they're British or Spanish, if they're an incumbent leader or brand new to politics, most election-winning speeches use the same tactics. Today, I'll break down what those tactics are. These tactics, let's face it, they won't help you win an election. There's much more than just speeches that's needed for that. But they should make you more persuasive in your day-to-day work. These tips should also make you a better public speaker and they should help you write better copy. Strangely, the study that reveals the most about the core components of an election-winning speech isn't a study that involves politicians. It's a study that involves mice and music. The researcher David Huron of Ohio State University has spent his career studying how mice respond to music. In his studies, he takes mice and plays them a loud noise. A noise like this. Usually after hearing this sound for the first time, the mouse will freeze in fear. It's loud, it's different, it's strange, the mouse doesn't like it. Play it again and the mouse freezes again. But play the sound enough times and the mouse starts to get used to it. David Huron writes that the mouse becomes habituated. It gets used to the sound, doesn't react anymore, and essentially stops paying attention. But Huron found a way to make the mouse pay attention again. To do that, he plays a different sound. This new sound startles the mouse again. It makes the mouse pay attention, not only when it hears this new sound, but also when it hears the original sound. The researcher David Huron calls this dishabituation. Hearing the new sound makes the original sound salient again. But after time, the mouse gets used to both of these sounds. They go about their business and stop reacting. But that's until the researcher introduces a third sound. This dishabituation keeps the mouse on its toes and it makes it pay attention again and again and again. To keep the mice attention for the longest period of time, David Huron found that the following sequence works best. In other words, the combination of repetition and newness keeps a mouse engaged. Now you're probably thinking, what the hell do mice have to do with election winning speeches? Well, David Huron has an answer. His findings into this sequence of repetition and variation, he says, reflect global music patterns from Vivaldi's symphony to reggaeton. David Huron is quoted in the book Hitmakers, saying, across the world, music is consistent with early repetition. The idea is to be repetitive up until a point where people might pull their hair out and then change things subtly. David Huron goes on to say, from a composer's perspective, to make something simple and beautiful, you could think, what's the minimal amount of material I can compose to entertain my audience for the longest period of time? The combination of repetition and novelty seems to be key to enjoyment. It's the case with classical music and in new music. David Huron goes on to say, people find things more pleasurable the more times you repeat them, unless they become aware that you are being repetitive. People want to say, I'm not seduced by repetition, I like new things, but disguised repetition is really pleasurable because it leads to fluency and fluency makes you feel good. So this combination of repetition and newness, it keeps mice alert, it makes music pleasurable, But what's it got to do with speeches? Well, according to Obama's speechwriter, John Favreau, it's got a lot to do with speeches. Now, John Favreau wrote one of the most quoted speeches of all time, a speech that was so repetitive that Obama almost rejected it for being too corny. It's the Yes We Can speech. Generations of Americans have responded with a simple creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Favreau's quoted saying that yes, we can is the simplest phrase you can imagine. Three simple words that people say to each other every day. 
but it's not the simple use of these words that makes the speech good, it's the repetition that makes it memorable and pleasurable. Yes, we can. Derek Thompson, who has spent far longer than me analysing election-winning speeches, notes that repetition in a persuasive political speech is extremely effective. You have repetition at the beginning of a sentence. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. You have repetition of the same word, like this example from Steve Ballmer at the Microsoft keynote. Developers, 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 developers. You have repetition with a brief interruption, like Frank Roosevelt's famous line. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is Or the simplest form of repetition. Here's Sarah Palin's domestic energy plans. Well, and we need to drill, 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 though. Using repetition to get a point across won't be new information to any of you listening. Many parents listening will know this firsthand. The best way to get a child to eat a food they don't like is to feed them that food a number of times. This isn't hearsay. There is evidence behind it in one 1990 study. This study found that you can make young children enjoy the bitter taste of broccoli by serving it over and over again with more pleasant food. Repeat exposure to broccoli alongside tasty food makes the broccoli palatable. Although scientists say it will take 15 servings of broccoli alongside tasty food to make it work. But this exposure to repetition doesn't only make these speeches more palatable, it makes them more believable. One eye-opening study involved showing participants several made-up bits of advice, several made-up myths, so to speak. The advice was stuff like, pineapple juice helps offset dementia. This is a lie. It doesn't do that. And most people know this. Immediately after reading this, participants correctly stated that this advice is untrue. However, several days later, the researchers checked back with participants and found that they were significantly more likely to say yes, pineapple juice really does help offset dementia if they had heard that advice a few more times. The repetition had familiarised the link between pineapple juice and dementia, and participants were therefore more likely to believe this myth. If this study holds true, then speeches with repetition, they're more likely to be believed. But there's another thing repetitive speeches do. Speeches like this from Hillary Clinton. Let it be that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all. And this from Bush. The advance of human freedom, the great achievement of our time and the great hope of every time, now depends on us. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. Well, by using repetition, they are also benefiting from alliteration. And alliteration, according to studies, also makes these speeches more believable. In a 2022 study, Hamish Bromley, Joanna Stanley and Richard Shotton ran a study to see if alliteration could make a speech more believable. They found 10 relatively unknown alliterating proverbs and rewrote them in a non-alliterating style. So, for example, he who rests grows rusty versus he who rests loses ability. Or courage kills complications versus courage erases difficulty. Or finally, a break will help you blossom versus a break will help you flourish. The exact same meaning, the only difference was the alliteration. Participants were shown these 10 proverbs, five from each list, five of them alliterating, five not, and they were asked to rate how believable each was on a nine-point scale. Turns out, the alliterating proverbs were ranked as 7% more believable and also 22% more memorable. Repetition and alliteration, it boosts memory and it boosts believability. But there is another trick that is often used in tandem with this, which is rhyme. Now, rhyme is used by lawyers to defend their clients. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit and by politicians to put down their opponents. Let's be carbon neutral, as I say, by 2050. Let's be carbon neutral by 2050 and Corbyn neutral by Christmas. 
But rhyme, like repetition and alliteration, isn't just a nice addition to a successful speech, it can be the single trait that makes a speech believable. A study conducted in the year 2000 by Matthew McGlone involved showing participants proverbs that rhymed and proverbs that didn't rhyme, like caution and measure will win versus caution and measure will win you treasures and riches, or woes unite foes versus woes unite enemies. Again, same meaning, the only difference is the rhyme. Next, McGlone showed 100 participants a list of 15 proverbs, randomly picking one out of each pair. So half would see woes unite foes, whereas the other would see the non-rhyming version, woes unite enemies. After the subjects had read through the list, they were asked to rate the phrases according to how accurate a description of human behaviour they provided. This approach allowed McGlone to compare the believability of both the rhyming and non-rhyming versions. And again, the result is really clear. The average believability of the proverbs in the non-rhyming condition was 5.26 on a 9-point scale, but the rhyming proverbs were ranked at 6.17 on a 9-point scale, and that is an improvement of 17%. Repetition, alliteration, and rhyme. These are three tactics that all of the best speeches appear to have in common. Now, on an earlier episode of Nudge, Dr. Jonah Berger, author of the best-selling book, Magic Words, shared three bits of advice for giving a persuasive speech. The first helps explain Trump's unconventional speech style that made him so popular. Whether you like Donald Trump or you hate Donald Trump, um, and, and uh, everyone's entitled to their, their opinions, whatever they, whatever they prefer, um, you can't deny that he's done a very good job selling his, his ideas. Um, so you, you've probably heard about this, um, uh, even if you're not in the United States, but certainly in the United States, um, you know, uh, many people have uh, followed Trump's rhetoric uh, and Trump's suggestions, even though a good portion of the population thinks they're crazy, that they're wrong, that they're only self-interested, they're not necessarily a good idea. He's gotten a good chunk of the American population to, to listen. To him. So one question is why, right? What is he doing? So if, if you go back and look um, at one of the speeches he made when he was running, he said something along the lines of the following, you know, if, if I'm elected, I'm going to build a, a great wall and, you know, nobody builds walls better than me. You know, our country doesn't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't anymore. When was the last time, uh, you know, uh, we beat China in a trade deal? I beat China all, all the time, all the time. And so he made this speech. And after the speech, the reactions were, were kind of mixed, right? A lot of the popular press said it was empty and vacuous and, you know, not very useful. Yet less than a year later, he was elected president. So something he's doing is, is working. What, what is it? I will never, ever let you down. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will build new roads and highways and bridges. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. And it turns out that what he's doing is, is not just about him, right? It's easy. Anytime there's somebody who has influence, um, uh, it's easy to say there's just them. It's just who they are, right? They're a, a great writer, a great speaker. But I think often these aren't things people are born with. These are things that are made. And so we need to look a little deeper. It turns up he's doing the same thing that um, successful entrepreneurs often do, top selling salespeople, even gurus often do which he's speaking with a great deal uh, of confidence. And, and to understand the science of confidence, or what science, uh, confidence is, where it comes from, I think it helps to, to go back. And, and so a number of years ago, um, uh, a scientist uh, in North Carolina um, went uh, to uh, courtrooms to understand the language uh, of courtrooms. And so uh, obviously lots of people are speaking in courtrooms. There are lawyers, there are judges, there are witnesses, both expert witnesses and non-expert witnesses, sort of regular fact witnesses. Um, and he was wondering what made them seem more, more credible. And so he recorded what they said. He played what they said to other people. Uh, and he found that there was a certain way of speaking that seemed to make certain types of speakers uh, more persuasive. Um, people tend to listen to, to what they said. So expert witnesses, for example, tended to speak a certain way that people uh, listened to what, he, what they said. And, and part of that might just be who they are, right? Again, they are great speakers. And so they are experts. But he did some experiments and he realized it wasn't just who they were. It was what they said in particular that made them impactful. So take the same exact person, change what they say, and people are more likely to, to listen to them. And, and one thing he found that they were doing was, again, this language of confidence, right? Speaking with confidence. And one thing he found um, that related to this idea of confidence was what's described as, as hedging. 
Uh, and so let me let me explain that briefly. So you know, to go back to to Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump often speaks with a great deal uh, of certainty. He speaks in absolute, right? This is definitely the right course of action. You know, it's unambiguous what we should do. It's undeniable that this will work. You know, he speaks in black and whites, right? Um, absolutes. There's no middle middle ground. Whereas most of us, when we speak, we often hedge, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as anybody, right? I probably have done this during this conversation. We say, you know, this might work. I think this is a good idea. This could be a good course of action. And we do that because it's an easy conversational pitch. When we're not sure exactly what we want to say, or, you know, we reach for these, these hedge words, but unfortunately, without intending to, we're often undermining our impact. Trump speaks with confidence, and he doesn't use hedges. But that's not the only way he becomes more persuasive. Like other persuasive speakers, he doesn't use filler words, words like um or er. Here's Jonah sharing a great example explaining why filler words can make you less persuasive. Yeah, I, I was working with a client and, um, uh, you know, I, I do some consulting with both individuals and firms. And I was working with a client um, who was trying to become a better communicator. And uh, we were working together uh, over the time that, uh, you know, COVID was happening and, you know, Zoom sort of sprung up as a way to communicate. Um, and during that time, Zoom released some new features. And one of those features was transcription. Um, and this, I feel like, is, it's been a game changer in, in general. It makes it really easy to get an output of, of a conversation. And I was talking to this client, trying to figure out what wasn't working. She was going over the sales pitch that she was looking to make. And you know, it wasn't landing how she had hoped. And I had some suggestions that made it better, but it still wasn't working exactly right. We're trying to figure out why. You know, when, when I looked at the words on the page, they seemed really good, but the pitch still wasn't landing. And so I, I had her give me the pitch and I, I transcribed it. And when I, when I transcribed it, the, the reason was, was clear, right? She was using filler words often. She was saying, you know, um, uh, or uh, we should, you know, this is the reason why, but, uh, you know, if you're thinking about it, um, the, the reason is uh, in using these fillers. And again, it's clear we use fillers. I, I use fillers all the time. The problem is when we use fillers, not surprisingly, it makes us seem less confident, makes us seem like we know less about what we're saying, which makes other people less likely to take our advice and less likely to want to see us as credible communicators. And so how can we get rid of these fillers, particularly if they are um, something we do all the time? I think the first thing is to speak rather than write, because we, we would never write with fillers. Right? No one would write something and say, um, uh, er, while well, we're writing, because when we're writing, we have the time to think through what we're going to say and edit, get rid of those uh, disfluencies uh, in, in our writing. Speaking, we don't have that. And so if you think that you don't say um, uh, or er, great, record yourself, uh, transcribe it or listen to it and see if you do. Sometimes we don't think we do, but we do a lot more than we think, particularly in speaking, because when we're speaking, we have to say something off the cuff. Right? We have to construct and refine what we don't have, we don't have time. If someone asks us a question and we're trying to respond we often use ums, uhs, or ers as, as a way of essentially buying thinking time. Someone asks us something, we say um, uh, or er, because we're trying to figure out what to say next. We're, we're making a sales pitch. We're giving a presentation. We forget what we want to say. So we, we fill it in with um, uh, or er to buy us time to think. And so watching ourselves speak, watching a recording or, or listening to a recording or even better reading a recording will help us identify those fillers. But secondly, what do we do instead? Right? Because it's great to say, you know, don't use fillers. But most of us would say, well, but sometimes we just need to think, right? How do, what do we do then? How do we solve that problem? And so, so then it's, it's not about never uh, using fillers. It's replacing them with something better. And that thing that's better is pause. Because it's not necessarily bad to take a little bit of a break from talking. And doing that can be even better than filling it with something that's not so useful. Research, for example, shows that response speed, when, when someone asks you a question, how quickly you respond or when someone is talking and they stop talking, you start talking, how quickly you respond can signal things about you. And in some cases, responding a little bit more slowly, particularly to questions, can indicate that you're being thoughtful, that you're thinking about what someone else. And that can be a, a positive signal of both you and, and what you're saying. Similarly, research we've done recently shows that speaking speed, how quickly we speak in response to somebody else, um, impact things like customer satisfaction or social relationships. Because Sometimes when we speak quickly, people go, oh, well, you're just saying whatever you're saying. You're not thinking about what I'm saying. Whereas when we speak more slowly and a little bit more deliberately, we're responding to someone else. It indicates that we're listening and have heard what they're saying and are taking the time to respond to it in what we're saying. And so pausing gives us time to think about what uh, to, to say, but also speaking more slowly, responding more slowly can be great ways to make ourselves seem more competent, more knowledgeable, more empathetic, like we're a better listener, 
rather than just filling that space with some words that aren't that aren't so useful. And and even take a speaker like Barack Obama, right? Former President Barack Obama of the United States. You know, he did such a good job of using pauses to draw attention. I don't do a, a, as good a job of this, but but he would say things like, "Look," and he paused for a couple seconds, and he'd use that pause to focus everyone's attention on what he's. Because he paused, we go, wait, hold, hold on, I got to pay attention to this because we're focused on it. Whereas if I'm speaking quickly, it's harder to focus on what I'm By removing filler words and leveraging pauses, politicians become more persuasive in their speeches. I've shared this before, but Obama was a master of pauses. I'm going to play you one of his speeches and just note how many pauses you hear. You are the best supporters and organizers anybody could ever hope for, and I will be forever grateful. Because you did change the world. You did. And that's why I lead this stage tonight even more optimistic about this country than when we started. Because I know our work has not only helped so many Americans, it has inspired so many Americans, especially so many young people out there, to believe that you can make a difference to hitch your wagon to something bigger than yourselves. Let me tell you, this generation coming up, unselfish, altruistic, creative, patriotic. In that 45-second clip, Obama pauses for one second or more, a whopping eight times. And Jonah has conducted studies that show how pausing like this and removing filler words and using fewer hedges, all of these things, they make you more persuasive. And to me... All of this paints a very clear picture. The political speeches that are remembered, shared and engaged with are usually ones that involve a combination of repetition, alliteration, rhyme, a healthy dose of confident declarations, no ums, no ahs, and plenty of considered pauses. Now, will this advice turn you into an up-and-coming political candidate? No, I don't think it will. You'll need much more than just a good speech to win an election. But if you want to persuade others with your public speaking, then follow this advice. If it made Barack Obama, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson electable, then it'll probably work for us in our day jobs. Okay, folks, that is all from me today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. But before ending, I need to give a big shout out to Derek Thompson and his wonderful book, Hitmakers. A lot of the material I've talked through in today's show is inspired by his work and this brilliant book, Hitmakers. So if you've enjoyed today's show and you want to discover what makes things popular, then go and check out his brilliant book. I also want to thank Jonah Berger for coming on Nudge. His fantastic book, like Derek's, is listed in the show notes. So head there if you want to pick up a copy. As always, if you've enjoyed today's show, please do leave the podcast a review. If you want more from Nudge, then sign up to my newsletter for bonus episodes and weekly tips. Just head to nudgepodcast.com and click newsletter in the menu. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can do so on LinkedIn. I'm Phil Agnew on there. Thanks again for listening, folks. I will be back next week with another episode of Nudge. Cheers.